Hi, I'm Jeff Russell. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this place is great, and I uh, always get a lot out of the conversations that I have when I uh, come visit the Global Priorities Institute. And thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a talk about the movie, uh, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Um, I didn't tell you that was required pre-reading, but um, uh, in case you haven't seen it, it's a really great movie. Go see it. Um, it's about the different ways that people cope with the multiverse. Um, and in that movie, the Everything Bagel is this symbol of the overwhelmingly vast amount of stuff out there. Uh, and the, in particular, it's a symbol for one character's reaction to that stuff, the villain, Jobu Tupaki. Um, and her reaction is right here, nothing matters. And I think that that's a pretty understandable reaction to the Everything Bagel. Um, is one way of thinking about it. So in the world out there, if we, we live in an infinite random world, then out there you'll find infinitely many children drowning in shallow ponds. And you'll also find infinitely many children being rescued from drowning in shallow ponds. And you'll find infinitely many rescuers and failures to rescue that look just like me. So now when I go along and consider this particular child in a, in a shallow pond, if I rescue them or if I don't, either way, I make no difference to the overall pattern of what the universe looks like. Um, and so it's very tempting to conclude that I haven't made any difference at all to the value of the world. The thing is, it's really plausible that we do live in a world like that. Um, this is a very live cosmological hypothesis that the universe is infinite in spatiotemporal extent. Um, that there's going to be, if, and, and so it's quite plausible that there are you know, out there infinitely many people at every level of welfare. Um, just about anything you might think of is happening somewhere. Um, so that means that I think contending with the everything bagel is actually a very live problem for us. Um, so uh, in particular, the thesis I'm going to be talking about is what I've called infinite futility. Um, if we live in an infinite random world, then no prospect is impartially better overall than any prospect that only finitely differs from that. And I'll unpack that a little bit more uh, later in the talk. Um, but the basic idea is, look, if there's all this stuff going on out there, and I only get to make a difference to this little bit of it, um, then that's no significant difference at all. I think if that's true, then it's a really strong challenge to a core idea in effective altruism. Um, and it's the idea that, as Andreas put it, we should strive to do the most good. Um, and in particular, strive to do the most good in a way that's neutral between causes, that's not preferential between caring for these people rather than those people. We're really thinking about doing the most good in a cosmic sense, trying to do the most good overall, everything considered. Um, I think, and in particular, uh, it's a challenge if we really do live in that kind of infinite world. And also, the interventions that we can make are finite, um, as is also plausible, that we can only, for, uh, that anything we might choose to do only has finite foreseeable effects. <clears throat> so if infinite futility is true in a world like that, um, then general overall betterness between prospects it doesn't give us any guidance whatsoever as to what we should do. <clears throat> okay, so I think that if infinite futility is true, then it's serious trouble for axiological altruism. Axiology, by the way, for, then for this is not in the jargon, that just means having to do with value, goodness, betterness, and worseness, as opposed to other ethical concepts like rightness or duty or care or things like that. Um, so the question is, is infinite futility true? And the talk generally is going to have two parts. Um, in the first part, I'm going to explain why I've generally not been convinced uh, by arguments for infinite futility. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about a new argument, hot off the presses, that I find very disturbing and just making me reconsider the whole issue. Um, so maybe you'll reconsider it too. I warn you ahead of time, it's kind of depressing. 
Okay, so in order to get conceptually clear about things, it's going to be helpful to think about some toy models of what the world might be like. So uh, here's our infinite world. There's going to be one person for every natural number. And there's going to be two ways for a person to be. You can be a happy person or you can be a sad person. Uh, so that means we could represent what I'll call simple outcomes just as a function that takes each natural number to zero for sad or one for happy. That looks like a picture. <clears throat> so how should we think about how good a world like that is overall? Well, here's a really flat-footed way of doing it that gets you to infinite futility. So here we've got these two worlds. There's infinitely many folks out there. Um, and one of those folks is Terry. And uh, in one of these worlds, Terry was sad. And in the other world, Terry was happy. He's the one at the, the line right here. And everybody else is just the same either way. Um, so one really flat-footed way of thinking about evaluating these, this kind of formula that uh, a lot of people are attracted to, is the idea that you should uh, maximize, the, that you should think about the total of welfare. So we could think about assigning each of these people a number, zero for sad and one for happy, say, and then add them all up. And the trouble is, if we've got infinitely many happy people out there, then the sum is infinite. And if we've, and that's true whether or not I make Tarot happy. And so you think, oh gosh, it's infinite either way. So it looks like it's just as good either way. Um, I've gotten nowhere. Okay, um, that's the most flat-footed kind of argument, and I just think it's not very good. Um, I think it does show us something. Um, what it shows us is just that sideways eight is a really bad way of representing the value of infinite world. And, and we've known that for a while. People keep doing this, and it bugs me every time. Um, but there are much better things to do. So don't do that. Don't do sideways eight. Um, and there's a couple of different ways of doing things other than sideways eight. So one is to turn to fancier representational structures. So instead of using real numbers or extended real numbers here with sideways eight added, um, you could use uh, other kinds of uh, representations of utility. There are vector utilities. One special case of that is uh, hyperreal utilities. And I think those are useful and good. Um, they, they are helpful for certain purposes. Um, but I also don't think that Utility representations are the core issue here at all. So let's think about what it is we're even doing when we talk about the overall value of the world. I really don't think we should take that too literally, as if our goal was, oh, there's this number written on the universe, and our goal was to make that number higher. Um, instead, uh, I think the right way to think about it is that when we talk about the overall value of the world, that's a way of talking about trade-offs. So if I make somebody better off, and that doesn't come at too serious a cost to, to me or to somebody else, um, then that uh, can, then the, the, the good that I've done can outweigh the cost at which it comes, and that's a good trade-off overall. And when we talk about this world as a whole being better than that world as a whole, I think that's just a way of talking about it being a favorable trade-off. It's a good trade-off, the, the, the various things that have been made better in this respect uh, versus the things that might be better, made better in that respect. So it's a way of thinking about lots of different, more specific ways that the world can be good, um, and how to weigh those up against each other. So if we start thinking about it that way, then this sideways eight thing is not tempting at all. Um, uh, don't worry about assigning numbers to these things. Well, later on, we can choose utility representations that reflect the judgments that we come to about all trade-offs. Um, but uh, we shouldn't start there. That, that's, that comes after. So let's think about some principles about trade-offs. And we'll think about some very simple ones that apply to these simple worlds. The first simplest one is a Pareto principle. So if we've got these simple outcomes with this structure, um, and I consider a world where I consider a pair of worlds where, comparing this one to this one, uh, nobody is worse off and somebody is better off, then this looks like it's a good trade-off. I mean, it's the best kind of trade-off. I've gotten something for nothing here. I've, uh, I've made the world better in a certain respect, and I haven't made it worse in any respect. 
these, by the way, this, one way these worlds are simple is that the only respect of uh, value that's relevant to them is how well off the people are. Some people think that's true in general. I kind of don't, but I'm happy to idealize. <coughs> oh, one other qualification. I've stated this in terms of people, because um, uh, I like people. Uh, some people think that you should do this sort of thing in terms of some other kinds of locations of value instead of thinking that uh, improving the life of a person is a good thing. It may be including, improving the local value of a region of space-time is what you should be paying attention to instead. There are technical debates there. Um, I'm pretty sure everything I'm going to say you can translate into whatever way of thinking about the locations of value you want. But I'm going to keep talking about people because um, I like people. I mean, I also like animals and robots and stuff, but. <clears throat> okay. So here's our starting place. Here's another principle about trade-offs that seems pretty good. A uh, principle of impartiality says that if I've got two worlds that are exactly alike, except that I've swapped the well-being of two individuals, um, then those two worlds are equally good. And again, that's reflecting the judgment that the trade-off of making this person happy uh, versus making that person happy, those exactly counterbalance each other. It's not like one person is more important intrinsically than any other. So once we got this on the table, there's a nice technical result that already kind of gets us the limits for what we're going to be doing. This uh, pretty well-known theorem, Basso and Mitra 2003, that says basically that it's impossible to represent any ordering of simple outcomes like this uh, using just real numbers or, or extended real numbers for that, case, for that matter. But that's okay. We're not worried about the representations. We use other things. It is certainly true that there are orderings like that. There are coherent ways of thinking about these trade-offs. And the simplest example is what I'll call the counting order. Uh, it's not a very good realistic theory of value, but it is a very good baseline theory. It's a much better baseline theory than uh, sideways eight. Um, so the basic idea is uh, comparing these two worlds, uh, I'm going to say that this world is at least as good as that one when, uh, if I consider how many people I've made better off, that's at least as high a number as the number of people that are made worse off. And that's the, that number on the right-hand side is finite. This is, in a way, it's a very weak order. It only uh, makes comparisons between worlds that only have finite differences between them. Um, so that's one reason why it doesn't seem like a very satisfactory stopping place. But I think it's a very good starting place. And the general reason is that um, any order of simple outcomes that satisfies Pareto and impartiality is going to extend the counting order. The counting order is kind of the, the generic uh, order of that type. Um, and furthermore, all of these orders, since they respect the Pareto principle, they don't get you infinite futility when it comes to simple outcomes. They say, that, hey, look, even if there's infinitely many happy people out there, and even if there's infinitely many sad people out there, one life makes a difference. If I, if I help you, then I've, uh, that's, that's good. Um, it's true that I haven't made any difference to the number of happy people or the number of sad people. That's okay. It's not numbers that we care about. It's people. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, maybe I do have time for this point. Another upshot of this to notice is that uh, these principles about trade-offs that I've argued for uh, have another... Um, uh, upshot for another principle, and it's generalizing the, the kind of thing that I just said. Uh, we don't care about numbers. In particular, uh, the, we can have two worlds here where this one is a Pareto improvement of that one. This one's sad, this one's happy. Um, and yet, both of these worlds are, as it were, qualitatively just the same. So the, the overall pattern of uh, uh, of happy and sad uh, is the same. And in this simple world, that's just a way of saying that the cardinality of the happy people and the cardinality of the sad people is the same in each case. But like I said, we don't care about cardinality. That's not the thing we're trying to improve. So I think that the right lesson is just that this principle of that well-being isomorphic worlds are equally good is just one we shouldn't be tempted by. Um, 
And I also think that it's not motivated by the same kinds of considerations that motivate impartiality. Impartiality, as I'm thinking about it, isn't a principle telling me that, oh, all that ultimately matters is the pattern. I don't care about the identities or something like that. Uh, rather, what's motivating it is the thought that here's a certain way of compensating for making things worse off by making things better off in, uh, in a counter-weighing counter, uh, way. Um, and that principle, you know, along with Pareto, is just inconsistent with the uh, isomorphism thought. Okay, there are other arguments um, that things get hard, but uh, this is enough to kind of get the idea of why I think that, okay, it is coherent to make sense of improving infinite worlds. Um, there are, there's a good and, you know, uh, positive, fruitful research project of trying to think about what these orderings should look like in more realistic scenarios than just these simple outcomes and also, uh, you know, getting us things, verdicts that are stronger than the ones that we get from just the counting order. That all looks like it's on track and not something to be super depressed about. So, have we escaped from the everything bagel? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So, like I said, these are theories, theories that extend the counting order. They don't give us infinite futility for outcomes, where an outcome is a completely specific way that these simple worlds might be. Um, but we're in a world that's not just huge, but also extremely uncertain. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about what the world is like. And if we are going to strive to uh, do the most good, then we're going to have to do that in a context where we don't know what the world is actually like in all its glorious detail. And that means that the kind of futility that should worry us is not about comparing outcomes, specifically ways the world could be, but rather about comparing prospects, where those involve uncertainty about what the world might be like. And here things are harder. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so we're going to be thinking about how to evaluate risky prospects, and we're going to keep on doing this using some toy models. Um, so we're thinking about uh, worlds that are both infinite, but also are highly random. Uh, and I'll, I'll spell that out in just a minute here. But before we do, let's think about some kind of basic, relatively uncontroversial principles about how to evaluate these prospects. The first is this principle I'll call equivalence. So uh, we've got these two prospects that might turn out lots of different ways. Here's an example. Um, uh, I've got a fair three-sided die. Those are pretty cool. Um, and uh, based on the outcome, um, uh, it's going to affect the well-being of Teru and Petra. Um, if it comes up uh, one, then Teru's going to be happy and Petra's going to be sad. Same if it comes up two. Uh, if it comes up three, then it's the other way around. That's option A. Option B is precisely the same, except that it's switched. On one and two, it's Petra that gets to be happy, and on three, it's Teru. Okay, so according to the impartiality principle, this outcome is just as good as that one, and this outcome is just as good as that one, and this outcome is just as good as that one. They aren't the same. In fact, these two options are guaranteed to turn out differently. Um, uh, for Teru, it matters very much uh, whether uh, we go for option A or option B, because that's going to determine whether it's him who's happy rather than Petra. Um, but if we're thinking about impartial overall value, then we should think that uh, this guy and that guy are equally good. And so these two options are certain to turn out equally well, no matter how the die comes up. Basic judgment, in cases like that, there's nothing to choose between the two prospects. From this impartial perspective, the two prospects are equally good overall. Okay, second principle, which I'll call stochasticism. So take another example. Option B is exactly the same as it was before. Option C is just like option B, except we've swapped uh, what, the one and the three. So over here, when it's one, it's Petra who gets to be happy. When it's three, it's Teru who gets to be happy. Over here, we've made it, okay, on one, it's Teru who gets to be happy. And on three, it's Petra who gets to be happy. Um, so again, these, these options aren't the same. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, 
the way uh, things are going to turn out in any particular case is uh, quite likely to be different. The chances are two-thirds that it's going to turn out differently. But nonetheless, uh, it seems that these options are also equally good. And the reason for that is, even though the specific uh, ways that things might turn out in different cases are different, the probabilities that they'll turn out that way are precisely the same. <clears throat> so in this case, either way, Petra has a two-thirds chance of being happy, and uh, Tira has a one-third chance of being happy. Um, and, and when I say that, I mean, in fact, in particular, that that particular way for the world to be uh, has a two-thirds chance or a one-third chance. So that's the basic idea, is that when we're weighing up prospects, all we need to go on is the probability measures over the outcomes, rather than some uh, more articulated thing, some extra structure. Uh, I want to just say as a technical point here, that I'm not thinking, when I talk about probability measures over outcomes, I don't just mean the probabilities of specific outcomes. We're going to be looking at infinite cases where there are uncountably many outcomes, and then each of those are going to get probability zero. That doesn't make them automatically stochastically equivalent. I really mean that the full probability measure over arbitrary measurable sets of outcomes uh, are the same in each case. So it's one way of thinking about what this says is that our, we can treat as our objects of evaluation when we're doing decision theory uh, to be these probability measures, which is standard. Okay. And that's all I'm going to do. So if we put these two ideas together, we get the notion of stochastic equivalence. We'll say the two prospects are stochastically equivalent when they both have precisely the same probability me measures over outcomes, at, respectively, as a pair of prospects that are certain to turn out equally well. So the thought is, I've got an option, and here's an option. So the thought is, these guys have the same probability measure. So there's two, two different prospects that realize the same probability measure. We're thinking of the prospect as telling us more than just the probability, just telling us how you know, outcomes are uh, attached to states, um, or like, more generally thinking about it. Um, and then these, in turn, uh, are equivalent in that they are guaranteed to be equally good. And in general, this relation is stronger than either of these uh, in particular relations. Okay, so that's the technical idea. And then the normative idea is that stochastically equivalent prospects are equally good. And that just follows from stochasticism plus equivalence. That's the name. Okay, so now let's try to apply this to our infinite random world. Um, and here's the basic uh, starting point here. Let's think about a case where uh, I'm going to look at probability measures where there's some finite number of people uh, that I might make a difference to, and so these probability measures can be arbitrary as far as uh, how things might go for those people. So there's 10 of them. So there's going to be 10 people that who knows what the probability measure is. It can be whatever we want. For everybody else in the universe, it's going to be a separate coin toss. Um, and this is a nice, well-behaved kind of probability measure. Um, obviously, it is simplistic. Um, uh, it's not that unrealistic. Um, uh, if we think about the kind of world that we're in, uh, there's lots of things going on in lots of places and things that are going on over here. Uh, yeah, uh, if you look at what's going on way over there outside at light cone, lots of stuff going on over there. Uh, they're, pr uh, from our epistemic perspective, probably pretty much independent um, as far as how well they go. And we've got you know infinitely many chunks like that, and we've only got this one chunk that we have to work with ourselves. That's not that different from these simple probability measures. So I think this is actually a helpful uh, kind of model. <sighs> okay, so let's look at a particular simple pair. Uh, so once again, I'm deciding whether or not to make Teru happy. But this time, I don't know what's going on with everybody except for Teru. It's a very simple probability measure. There's only one person I get to make a difference to. I can either make Teru sad, or I can make him happy. And everybody else is a dependent coin flip. 
Seems like an easy choice, right? Seems like, once again, thinking about the trade-offs, that should totally make Teru happy. Here's the bad news. Oh, whoops, I didn't write it down there on the slide. The bad news is that the sad prospect and the happy prospect are stochastically equivalent, and it makes me cry. I thought this had to be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's right. Um, so the full argument for this is a bit technical. I'm really happy to go over later with people who like technical details, but I, I'm going to go through the basic idea of the proof, right, which I think is reasonably intuitive. Okay, so for any particular one of these simple prospects, we consider we can consider what I'm going to call the partial distributions. So if we've got all of these people, then the partial distributions are going to be thinking about how things go for just subpopulations. And so we're going to, if we've got this probability distribution over the whole world, then we can kind of project it down to just finitely many of its dimensions, and that's going to give us another probability distribution. And we can think about that probability distribution in particular as being over the total uh, value rather than just over the specific outcomes. So we think about how many happy people we get. Um, it, and if, according to the counting order type things, that's going to be useful information. So let's think about how the partial distributions go for the sad prospect, where I leave poor Teru totally unhappy. So if I just consider Teru, just that very first person, then its probability is 100% that zero people will be happy. If I consider the first two people, then there's 50% probability that uh, there's zero people happy, a 50% probability that there's one person happy, just depending on you know, what the second person looks like. And then likewise, if I look at the first three, I've got this quarter, half, quarter distribution, and so on. As we get bigger and bigger, we get these Bernoulli distributions, um, with very nice, well-behaved, familiar distributions that are kind of going to gradually smooth out into wider and wider bell curves. So that's how things go if Teru's sad. What about if it's happy? Well, if I just consider Teru, then the distribution looks totally different. It's a 100% chance of a happy person. Um, if I consider the first two people, now it's 50-50, not between 0 and 1, rather between 1 and 2, and so on. I get the same Bernoulli distribution, but it's all shifted over just by 1. So let's look at how these two distributions, uh, two sequences of distributions, look in uh, compared to each other. They start out totally different. At the first step, now 50% of each of them overlaps. It looks the same. It's still 50%, but now we've gone up. It's a little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more. And the farther on we go, the more and more these distributions overlap. Um, and so the technical fact here is that the sequences of partial distributions get closer and closer together with respect specifically to this uh, thing called the, the total variation distance, which is basically just telling you how much the blue one sticks out over the orange one plus how much the orange one sticks out over the blue one. So that's the technical point. If we consider larger and larger finite chunks of the world, the distributions over how things are going look more and more similar. But now here's the second fact. When that happens, we have stochastic equivalence. We've got, uh, if we're thinking about a... Uh, an equivalence relation that respects the impartiality principle, the swapping to uh, individuals, then it turns out to be a sufficient condition for the overall infinite distribution probability measures uh, to be stochastically equivalent um, that the uh, finite bits of them get closer and closer together in this way. This is the technical part. I didn't find this obvious. Um, it's not impossible that I've made a mistake somewhere in this proof because it is kind of techy, but I'm pretty sure it's right. Um, I'll let you know if it turns out that we're saved. But uh, um, uh, and the intuition is just well, look. The, at the, when I got this little gray part here, let's go back to the slide. So when I got the gray part here, that tells me that there's a way of kind of rearranging the. So the idea of stochastic equivalence is it's kind of a way of rearranging the states without changing the probabilities of the outcomes, uh, where I end up lining up equal outcomes with equal outcomes. So this tells me well, look. For 50% of the possibilities, there's a way of rearranging them so that I've lined so that I've lined up possibilities where one happy person is out of you know out of these out of the first two people, one of them is happy, and furthermore, everything is the same thereafter. I consider pairs like that, 
or I can, and now as I go up here and get bigger and bigger gray areas, uh, I can rearrange more and more states um, to uh, line them up that way. And in the limit, I've done them all. Okay. So that's the sad fact. Happy and sad are stochastically equivalent with respect to any impartial equivalence relation on outcomes. How are we doing for time? Pretty good. So that's the technical fact. And so the philosophical conclusion here is these principles that look pretty awesome, impartiality, stochasticism, and equivalence together imply a version of infinite futility. They imply that in these kinds of simple worlds, infinite random worlds, that's code here for these uh, simple probability measures, uh, any two prospects uh, uh, that differ with, with respect to only finitely many people uh, are equally good overall. I only gave you the argument for that simple pair, but once you've got that one equals zero, it's not hard to start deriving lots of other uh, conclusions from that. Okay, so that seems kind of bad. Um, uh, let's make it worse. So something I didn't tell you is how these uh, two uh, simple prospects are correlated with each other. I didn't tell you anything about the joint distribution between them because I didn't have to. All that mattered from the stochastic equivalence relation uh, was how each of those particular actions was distributed over outcomes. But let's consider now how they're distributed with respect to each other. Um, and there's various ways of thinking about that. There's a kind of cool philosophical problem in the neighborhood here called the puzzle of Morgan Besser's coin, which is like, uh, if I'd done something differently, would that coin still have come up the same way or not? Don't really have to get into that, but if, if we're thinking about you know, the randomness out there, we might think that it's going to be the same whatever we do, or we might think that it's going to be you know, what we do given different act with different actions. Maybe they're independent of each other, or maybe there's some other kind of relation. But let's just stipulate that they're precisely correlated. Let's consider the prospects where um, the thought is, I'm going to make Taylor sad or happy, and everybody else it's a coin flip, but it's the same coin flip uh, that comes up the same way, regardless of which option I choose. So that means that whatever the outcome is for everybody except Teru, it's the same between my two options, even though I've, I don't know what it is. Um, you know, it, could be any, it could be anything, uh, but it's going to be the same anything, uh, whichever thing I choose. Well, that means that whatever I do, so kind of fix whatever the outcome might be over there, uh, they, between these two options, uh, all that's different is I've made one sad person happy. In other words, I have a Pareto improvement. I've uh, made one person happy, happier than they were, and I've left everybody else precisely the same. Which means that according to this Pareto principle, uh, whatever the outcome is of my act here, it's going to be the same uh, whatever I choose. Uh, uh, sorry, what I meant to say, whatever the, the outcome of my acts might be, uh, it's going to be better if I choose happy than if I choose sad. Um, so, but that looks like a good reason to say that happy is better than sad, right? It's guaranteed to turn out better in this case. And we can capture that intuition with a principle that decision theorists like. It's a dominance principle. Um, in particular, well, the uh, strict version here says that if A is certain to turn out strictly better than B, then A is strictly better than B overall. I threw in the weak version here too, so that this principle subsumes equivalence, so we don't have to state it separately. Uh, but don't worry too much about that. Um, so the overall picture here is that between happy and sad, dominance plus Pareto says that happy is strictly better than sad, but impartiality plus stochastic equivalence says that happy and sad are equally good. Contradiction. So these four principles, which are kind of like all I felt like I had to go on when I was doing infinite ethics, impartiality, Pareto, stochasticism, and dominance are jointly inconsistent. And in the course of this talk, I've defended each of these four principles. I also, in a different talk uh, here, uh, argued against that principle, but I've uh, been bracketing that. Um, okay, so what do we conclude here? It's really 
This is how all my talks end, with a whimper. <laughs> Come on, guys. Can't, can't abstract reality just give us a break for once? Um, okay. Um, I've got a list of options that we might uh, take as given here. Um, rather than go into each of them in detail, I think I want to leave lots of time for questions. So maybe we can talk about the ones you want to talk about. Um, I'll, I, maybe I'll just say quickly what each of these options is. So the first idea is that we just shouldn't be doing infinite ethics. You know, the answer is don't think about it. Um, uh, and in particular, we just shouldn't worry about evaluating these infinite random worlds. Just uh, forget about it. Um, uh, I think that's a hard road to hoe, just given the state of like cosmology and stuff. But I don't know. Um, another thought is that we reject the stochasticism idea, these probability measures aren't enough. I think that's the most promising way to go if we're looking for kind of a merely technical solution to this technical problem. Uh, but I think it's going to be really, really hard. Um, it's saying that like, we just can't do decision theory the way, the way that we're used to doing it, where we weigh things up according to probabilities. Um, and we need something else, and I don't know what that something else might be. Um, um, we could reject these kind of basic decision, other basic decision theory principles, equivalence and dominance, or we could go full everything bagel. We say helping one person doesn't matter from the point of view of the universe. Um, and uh, so we go for infinite futility, um, and we either give up on the axiological altruistic idea of trying to do the most good, or we keep it and go all in for trying to do infinite good. Um, some people were kind of being pushed that direction anyway, so maybe, I don't know. Or, okay, the kind of depressing conclusion that I've been leaning more and more towards lately um, is that we got off on the wrong foot at the beginning here. Um, that there's just something incoherent about this idea about totally impartial between everybody, completely overall consider balancing off every consideration kind of value. Um, the, you know, the idea of doing the most good doesn't make sense without qualification. Um, um, or even if there is such a thing, it's not the sort of thing that can guide the choices of action for mere mortals. Um, I mean, this is, you know, one paradox among a bunch. I kind of feel like uh, we've been getting pushed, I've been, I've been getting pushed in this direction from a bunch of different angles. Um, and, and so the upshot of that would be that that thesis that I was calling axiological altruism is false. Um, there isn't any context in which uh, what's impartially better overall uh, should guide our actions. Um, Overall, meaning, you know, in a way that's completely neutral between causes, in a way that's not preferential between individuals or uh, locations or anything like that. Um, I don't think that's doomed for effective altruism. I do think that it's a good reason to think hard about its foundations. Um, the balance of cosmic value on this picture doesn't give us any reason to rescue this drowning child um, or, or, you know, any other altruistic intervention. But we still might have good reasons, we just have to locate them somewhere else. So I'm going to close, uh, letting the last word uh, go to everything everywhere all at once. Um, and then we'll do some questions. Okay.